Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast, our first episode of March 2023. It's going to be a very busy month here on the podcast at Lions247.com and here in Happy Valley in general. Just a couple of weeks from now, we're now under the two-week mark uh, till Penn State gets going for spring practices. That follows directly after spring break, Penn State wrapping up winter workouts this week. And in fact, they're going to open the doors to some media members on Thursday. So stay tuned to Lions 24-7 for coverage of Penn State's max out workout session as they finish up winter workout action in the weight room. Get a week or so to, to head home, head on spring break wherever they're going. And then it's back in pads as action gets underway leading up to the Blue White game in Beaver Stadium in April. Marsh, of course, is going to be a very busy phase of the recruiting calendar, the dead period ending, and guys are going to be visiting campuses across the country. Happy Valley will be a popular destination. Tyler Calvaruzzo, our insider for recruiting at Lions247.com, will hop on this podcast, a breakdown and upcoming announcement that impacts the Nittany Lions 2024 recruiting class, and he'll also focus in on wide receiver position as that 2024 target board begins to shape take shape. But we begin this episode of the Lions 24-7 podcast by bringing back, for a second time, Andrew Rappelier. We heard from Andrew last year, a bit after his commitment to the Penn State Nittany Lions 2023 recruiting class. His football career at the high school level is over. His basketball career is still going strong. In fact, he's a few hours away from a quarterfinal matchup in playoff action. So, Andrew, thanks for making some time for us here during the week ahead of that matchup for you. Of course. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Well, you just yeah, yeah. You just went through the the scenario with me. You're the one seed. You guys have had a fantastic season. You're trying to win this game to get to the next one, to get to the next one. But your days are starting to dwindle as a basketball player at the high yes, school sir. level. How have you enjoyed this winter? This opportunity to go out there and attack the court. I've really just enjoyed the competition and really just you know finishing out my high school career because I know I'm, the reality is I'm never gonna get to play basketball again. Um, you know, I've just really enjoyed it, you know, taking the court with a bunch of my, my good buddies. And, um, yeah, I just want to end it on a strong note. So next couple games got to pull it off and then I'm, you know, back to what's really important. So we've yeah. become pretty familiar with you as a football player, Andrew, but what's the scouting report on you as a basketball player? If there's some pickup <laughs> action uh, in the near future at Penn state, what, what are you going to do on the court? What have you done this season? Where are you and, and, and how you have you contributed to this impressive run? So uh, I come off the bench as like a sixth, sixth man normally. Um, we got a really, really good team. We got a kid going to Harvard, uh, High Point, uh, probably a Holy Cross commit. Um, these are all basketball kids too. So, mm -hmm. um, But uh, I play out of the post a good bit. I play like the three, a four. I'll go down to the five when we go small sometimes. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're mainly a guard, guard team. But when we get it into the post, that's where I come in. So. Um, especially I've, you know, I've gotten my, my weight on some about like 200, just, just over 240 pounds now. So, um, so yeah, I've just contributing down low and everybody else does the guard, uh, does everything out wide. So we're doing really good, but, um, yeah, I feel good about it. Well, you mentioned now you're, you're, you're over 240 pounds. Penn State announced you on signing day back in December at six foot four, 235 pounds. Do you have a, a goal weight? I'd imagine once basketball season ends, and that's going to be within the next week or so, one way or the other, you're going to be refocusing it and on your football preparation yeah. and the training to get you to hit the ground running. Is there a target weight for, for a campus arrival? I want to just, I mean, I'm 240 two pounds with basketball and that's just saying a lot with like I'm con like the conditioning and the running and everything. It hasn't really ran any weight off me. I've been keeping my, uh, keeping my tabs in the weight room and everything. Um, but really just like, I feel great right now, but it's going to come with more like really, really digging down and conditioning and working hard and, you know, cleaning up my, making sure my diet's good on that end for the next three months and just be really prepare for those workouts when I get there. Cause it's complete, uh, change in environment and the intensity of the workouts with coach Chuck are going to be pretty mental. So be ready for that. So, uh, but yeah, I want to get there like, uh, like a high two thirty, low two forty, whatever, really. But I kind of, I'm just really happy that like when I was being criticized for being 210 pounds for the longest time and I just worked really hard at that and now I feel good about it. So and I haven't lost a step. I'm, I'm jumping. I'm still, I can windmill still. I can run still well. Uh, we're actually going to test 40 soon here, so find out where I'm sitting there. But last yeah, time, I'd love, love to hear that. 
Yeah. So last time I tested, I ran really well. I was, I was about 222, 221 pounds. So what was your time at that weight? I ran 451, 455, 455. So, yeah. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing the results if, if you'd like to share them down the road. Yeah, but, of course. Yeah, yeah. You talked about maybe taking that a little personally, people pointing to your 210 pound weight at, at one point. Were you still six foot four at that stage as well? Yeah, I was just, um, I'm just over six four. I'm like six four and a quarter, maybe six four and a half. And then I was about that too. I haven't really grown much. Um, but uh, oh yeah, I was I was just lean. It was all just like I worked I worked really hard in the weight room. Definitely not as hard as I did now. But it was also it's just dieting. I mean, like eating and just, like can't get big if you don't eat. That's one thing yeah. I learned was I really just learned it was just like I got a bigger breakfast, bigger lunch. You got to eat big meals. You got to you know eat your body weight and protein every day. That's so what and then that's honestly what I'm doing. Like cutting back on now is like when I had to get when I had to gain all this weight and. I mean, yeah, the reality was if I wanted to wait and be show up there at 215, I'm just, you know, a bigger, larger gap for myself from getting on the playing field. I mean, getting on the field, getting some play time. And that was just a reality of it. Like, yeah, every coach is telling me, you get here, our weight program will get you right. You'll get big from this and whatnot. But I was like, coach, I'm going to do my part here. So when I get there, I can be ready to go. That's my thinking. Um, so I've been just working really hard at that. And but I, yeah, I took it. I took it personally. When everybody was telling me like, yeah, I could run routes and everything, but like, can I keep that when I gain my weight? And I just was just like, yeah, I, I can do that. I can do that. Well, Andrew Rapelier was a big riser in 24-7 sports rankings over the course of his final year at the high school level, uh, up into the top 24-7 rankings, uh, just outside the top 10 overall rankings at number 11 among tight end prospects with a high four-star rating um, out of Milton Academy. And, and I, I want to address a few things here, Andrew. You, you mentioned that, that, that weight gain. What's the timeline there? I mean, going from 210 to 240 pounds at the same height in high school, how long has that taken you? Uh, it took me a, a good bit. Um, it's kind of my senior year. It's definitely picked up. So I was um, at the end of last year. I remember when we tested, we did we did like all our numbers lifting wise, and I did okay. I did definitely did like solid, but I I knew how much improvements I can make. And I had a pretty good. I was committed to the weight room, but I was never like committed to a program, like a like a strict lifting program with conditioning and everything I needed to do plyometrics and. Um, I, I came across that because my roommate last year, because I go to boarding school, was very, very focused on his lifting and very, you know, just that's he's locked in on that. And he was, he's going to Holy Cross along to that. Um, and I got on the program and we tested and I was like two, I, met, I remember I weighed 214 pounds in July or I, on my OV, I was six, six, four and a quarter and I was 214. And I remember looking at my official visit pictures. I was lean. I was very mm. lean. Um, and I got in the program, I started lifting, and I just said to myself around when I got back home, it was June, like, 8th. I got back home, and I just started eating, like, bigger meals. And I, I obviously not eating like a, like a horse, eating bad crap, just, like, eating good, bigger meals, lifting really hard, and I just stayed consistent with it. My brother told me he played at Wake Forest. He was very consistent, and that's how he got big and got heavy. So I'm saying very consistent constantly. And and also was not gaining too much weight too fast, so I was like making sure I gained like a couple, like a pound, literally like a pound a week, or like two pounds, three pounds a month. So we get to August, I show up to school, I'm two twenty seven, two twenty eight, uh, mm-hmm. gained and myself like ten pounds in like two and a half, three months there, and that's just consistency. And then the season starts. That's like a month later after I got to school, I'm two thirty two, and then I'm still working out consistently and eating well and this is also me just maturing and really hitting my like getting out of teenage years and whatnot um and football's progressing i'm gaining like i'm still gaining this weight slowly i by the start of the season i'm 230 232 end of the season i'm 236 and then after the season ended this is around like november i lost a little weight just like just like from i don't know just cleaning my body up resting taking care of my body and everything out of the season. I lost like I was 231, 232. I got three weeks, four weeks before basketball starts, and I really started working there. Got up to like 237 again. And then um, basketball starts, and I started really conditioning, and this only boosted my lifting. Like I was, I felt like I was really getting a sweat while lift, pushing the same weight, using this, doing the same workout, 
and just eating like a like eating the same amount. But I just had a really basketball just makes when you're 240 pounds running up and down with 180 pound guards all day is gonna make you feel good. Yeah. So, yeah. so I get to like now I'm like 240 pounds and I feel good. So it uh, sounds last. like. A- Process, man. It's a process, but I—I I mean, yeah. for for when you're looking to gain, I've talked to specifically tight ends because this always seems to be a spot where you make that transition from high school to college. You're putting on 20 to 30 pounds. We saw it with Brenton Strange. Uh, we've seen yeah. it with guys like Tyler Johnson, and those conversations are always like, "Well, what did you eat?" Now, I've heard peanut butter is a bit of a magic trick and trying to put on weight. It a bunch is. of chicken <laughs> breast. Well, I mean, do you have any advice out there for maybe some of those athletes that, that are trying to do the same thing as you in terms of what clicked and, and how you're able to, to put on that kind of a weight in a relatively short period of time? Yeah. the, fa- the I mean, the fact is, like, you just – you have to eat when you're just, like, not, like, bored, but, like, you're not hungry. You, you still have to eat. Like, when you have a big mm-hmm. meal, you got to eat till you're, like, full. That's the one thing I would eat these me- I would eat like a meal and I'd be like, yeah, like I just ate. I'm good. But, like, am I full? Like, like, it sounds crazy. I feel like I'm like, I feel like a fat ass right now. I'm talking about this. <laughs> but there's a reality. <laughs> um, but it's like uh, chicken, a lot of chicken meals, steak, like real protein after lifts, not like shakes before lifts protein. Like when you, before you lift, you're lifting, you're not really moving. So you can eat a lot. So you eat a lot of, I eat like a big chicken sandwich with a, uh, chicken sandwich like a granola bar and like a couple like two big water bottles before i work out and i feel great doing my lift i'm moving weight and i also just got a lot of protein in before the lift and i do the same thing after so when i would go to the gym i'd go to the gym i would get a shake at the gym then i'd go to chipotle with my two of my buddies i had my first dinner then i'd go back home like 40 minute drive <laughs> then have my second dinner from my home cooked meal for my mother which is the best and that was key but like uh at the like at night when I say I hadn't eaten too much, peanut butter and jelly, chocolate milk, peanut butter and jelly, chocolate milk, consistency. Like even with eating every night, and then but dinner wise, it's just like when I'm at school, it's kind of getting in the food that's like not great from the dining hall, yeah, and like you know ordering and whatnot. But um, when I'm home, like home cooked meals, having a mother takes care of me, just the best thing ever. And she kind of, I mean, the food bill definitely saw the was hurting when I was on my bulk, but it, you know, it had to be done. So, uh, but yeah, that grocery bill, I'm sure it was skyrocketing with yeah. you, you consuming all those calories. Don't worry. They have a really good nutrition uh, team <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and culinary team waiting for you here on campus. Let's talk yeah. football. Now that we've kind of caught up on where you are with your progression as you That's get right. ready to make this major move. Uh, we talked about it uh, before we started recording your, your nothing finalized yet with your enrollment plan, but you're targeting that May enrollment, get on campus for that first summer semester. Um, what are, is on your checklist between now and then, you know, once you get through basketball, hopefully you end up with a trophy out of the whole process, but what's on that to-do list to make sure you're ready to roll? Really just, I mean, just cleaning everything up. Like I've done like, I, in the sense of I really worked hard with my weight and like my, my footwork and just everything with my game and like my training. And it's really just like cleaning everything up, learning, learning the playbook part. Like I'm really working on that right now. I'm working with coach uh, Rocco like two or three times a week on zoom while just cause I can't, I'm not there. That's the reality of it, but I got to make time to, you know, get that stuff down. Cause if I get there and I know everything, it's only going to make the transition a lot easier and me, like I can jump in and I can hopefully get reps right away you know, start practicing and understanding everything, you know, but, um, there's that part. Um, and from like a, how do I put this? Like really just mentally taking the transition to preparing myself for like realizing that I'm not going to be in the high school environment anymore. I'm really, I'm with all we're there. I'm at Penn state and it's just, all of us are there to make it to the next level and it's, everyone's just got to work. And it's not like I'm going to be playing. I'm going to be playing with kids who are just as good as me and have the same intensity as me or as competitive as me, but want it as bad as me. And it's just like stuff like that. So I just got to be ready to do that. And uh, it comes with training and really these next two months, just locking in and prioritizing football and like what really matters. And yeah, I've been in high school for like six damn years. Like I'm two months <laughs> away from the diploma. Once I get it, got to get that part done too, but I'm, I'm going to, that'll be easy, but. It's just really working hard, mentally preparing. So, and you've done the boarding school thing here, the, the, you know, the, at the end of your high school career. I mean, does, does that prepare you in some ways, as opposed oh. to a kid who's you know heading home every afternoon to mom and dad? 
Yeah, fully. Yeah, when uh, when I was talking to a bunch of the guys who enrolled early, they were just talking about uh, their transition, not being with their family, their mother, and stuff was really difficult for them. And uh, obviously, I totally see can see that, and it was for me too when I when I first left. But I'm like, I've been away from home for two years. I go home like not often. I go home like six times a year. It feels like because how much, how many breaks I get? Like two, three breaks a year, and uh, my parents will you know get me home a couple other times. But, like I don't get to see my family often, and that's really helped me develop my responsibilities and like as an individual and, you know, help me really focus on what matters. And it's also given me like a vision of like how I want to, what I want to do with my life and like how I want to, what I want to do with my football career and everything. So it's also uh, given me a lot more like fuel to the fire. So you mentioned uh, getting an opportunity to study up on the tight end position. What awaits you there at Penn State? Going through some of those sessions a few times per week via Zoom. What stands out when you've had a chance to review some of that film from the 2022 season? The way they used guys like Brenton Strange and Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson. And how do you see yourself maybe filling into one or, or two of those roles that you've been able to observe? Well, there's the the thing. Crazy thing is, there's just no like. As of right now, there's no distinguish, distinguished difference I see between the Y and the H. It's just like every every tight end does everything. They can play anywhere. And basically from the way I'm hearing is I'm he's starting everybody, like Coach Hal, Coach Rocco starts everybody just learning the Y position. Just like the simple – not like the simple part of it, but like having them learn the Y because it only makes it easier to learn the H. So from what I see is like – well, first things first, they can literally do anything they want with that offense. Like there is so much, like, it's like, I, it's, it's like a foreign language when I look today, I'm slowly learning it and I'm learning bits and pieces, but it is, it's a lot. And just really learning that, like learning to keep the terms and breaking down every little piece of it and learning every little piece, piece by piece is like the key part because fully understanding the playbook is like the way that it translates to getting on the field. Because if you don't know that the reality is like coach, how can't put me or really anybody who lacks under knowledge, like understanding of the playbook on the field, because it's only going to jeopardize us as a team. And seeing how much they require from me in the sense of I have to know that. And that's like, that's a lot. And they understand that. And that's why Coach Rocco is really working with me, like as much as he is. And I just see how, like, I really like how the H back plays and what they do with the H back. So that's why I'm really excited about that. From what I've seen, like they have, he moves all around in the backfield. He leads through the holes. He kicks out. They do trickery with him. And I just, I'm really excited about that. But like, like Coach Al and Rocco were saying, I got to learn, understand the basics first, and that comes with understanding the why. So there's a lot to it, but it's 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 really it's interesting and it's a beautiful work, honestly. It's like seeing all the what they can do with it. So. It's a tight end room that's evolved in front of our eyes here lately. Brenton Strange is getting ready for the NFL draft. Of course, Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren still on campus. Khalil Dinkins is in year three trying to make his move. But a couple of your classmates who followed Jerry Cross, a freshman last year to campus, uh, Mega Barnwell arrived in January, as did Joey Schlaffer. What's the early feedback from those guys? You know, they're, they're going through a process that I'm sure – you kind of wish you were already underway with, but yeah. it awaits you here in a couple months. What are you gaining from, from their experience? From what I, I mean, I haven't really been talking to them a whole lot, honestly, because when you're there, they like they're focused. And I mean, I'm doing my thing here. The reality is I'm just like, I, I'm honestly not that close with them yet. And I, but I'm just going to change once I get there. But I see Joey and Joey's like, I see how he's been doing with the winter workouts. He looks like he's loving it. And both of them, from what I know of them, they really have embraced like, like the, the change and the transition, they love it. And I mean, as for all of us in the class, from what I see, we, I mean, we wouldn't be going to Penn State if we didn't all like would die for football. We love football, like do anything for it. And like they're, I mean, I think they're really just living their dream right now. Like, they, yeah, the workouts are hard, but I don't think anyone, uh, any of us would rather be doing anything else other than, you know, working, living our dream, playing football, Penn State. So uh, they're really loving it. And I think Joey's really embracing it. He's doing great, obviously, by the feedback I've seen from Coach Howell and the, the Aces page and everything. So, uh, but I'm excited for him, really. So, but uh, I'm just really, I'm excited to be the next one there. <laughs> Right. When you've got a room like that, where there's some veterans who played a bunch of Big Ten football, there's guys that are your age who are hungry to get going. And there's a couple guys in between there who've been around the program for a bit. They're trying to hold off the younger guys. They're trying to get closer to the veterans. 
What do you think about the competition that awaits you uh, come enrollment? Uh, yeah, it's going to be intense. And I, I've like uh, Khalil has been really working. Like he's been kicking ass in those workouts and I mean, everybody has, and it's really t- tight competitive room, but you know, I, I feel at the end of the day, like everybody feels good about their own game and I feel great about my game. Obviously I have no idea what it's like cause I haven't gotten there yet. And that's been like seeing these workouts have honestly been very eye opening to me. And like, this is really going to take a lot. And I got to work my ass off if I want to be successful there. And I'm ready to do that. I mean, that's the reality of it is nothing's going to be given. And I know that. And yeah, like, obviously there's nothing, nothing in the corner of a, like for a freshman and nothing being a freshman, there's nothing that's amazing about that in the sense of everybody's like, you're just a freshman. You're not having done anything. They're not expecting a whole lot from you in the reality of it, but like I want them to expect a lot from me. And uh, like I'm expect I'm excited to get there and show what I've been working on and you know, play football, do what I can do and you know, hopefully see what how it thinks of my game. But obviously I want to win games and I've got four years there, so plenty of time to develop. I can redshirt, anything can happen. So just embracing it all. I'm excited for it. Obviously, it is a, you know, a, a legacy in that room, too, with Mike Kosicki going on. Looks like he's going to make himself a bunch of money as an NFL free agent this year. Uh, Pat Fryermuth off to a very strong start with the Pittsburgh Steelers in his career. Now, Brenton Strange at the NFL Combine. and You're the next part of that process at, at tight end for Penn State. And looking over what you did at the position as a senior, you know, people listening to this probably wondering, OK, you added all this weight. How did you perform? Well, you were over 20 yards per reception again as a senior, uh, 499 yards, six touchdowns on 23 catches. Uh, that means you averaged 22 yards per catch in the last two seasons, and you reached the end zone on more than 20% of your catches the last couple of seasons. How would you serve up the scouting report from your senior season? You gave us one before your senior season on the show. I want to hear how you feel like you came out the other side as a balanced tight end who can perform through the air and also on the ground as a blocker? I just feel I've I've become a better, more complete tight end from what I was last year. And I know that was kind of what I said a lot about myself last year. But truly, it's a sense of I've grown into the physical position and requirements of the position. And I've really worked on my true positional skills. I play H-back in high school. I can kick out anybody. I can lead through the hole. I can open up opportunities for somebody running and as for a route running and getting open, I really feel like I check most of those boxes. And um, yeah, it's just, I, tr- I work really hard. It's the one thing I, I feel nothing's been given to me. I gaining 35 pounds wasn't e- 30 pounds wasn't easy and I, I, no days off. And that's kind of the way it's always been for me. But as a player, I just, I work hard and I want to continue to advance as a blocker as a receiver, but I think the one thing that still really, really is going to determine how I am, how successful I am in college is kind of just if I can keep everything up in the sense of working hard and training hard and staying healthy, which is the number one thing. But as I, my love for the game is never going to, I mean, my love for the game is only going to flourish getting to Penn state. And I know that if I just work hard, that anything's possible. And as my parents tell me, I see it with Pat, I see it with Mike, I just now got to keep my head down, not talk about myself, stay humble, just work my tail off. So and that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do. And I want to finish with a family question here because you, you've got quite the athletic gene pool that you're coming from. Your, your father played college football. Uh, your mother played college basketball at Virginia, went on to play professionally in Europe. Uh, and then you mentioned this early in our conversation. Your brother uh, played football at Wake Forest. Uh, what, what's it like growing up in a family where everyone seems to be able to go out and, and pursue some athletic dreams? And it must have instilled something in you at a relatively early age. I mean, it's, it means a lot. And the, and the athletic and competitive spirit was kind of – I was born with it, really. It just didn't really develop. I was always been that way with, like, even when I was five years old, riding bikes against my neighbors, for God's sake. Like, I, even that was a Super Bowl to me. Um, and – just having dinner with my family and everyone just breaking down their day. What happened in the athletic world was just a big thing. And hearing the stories about my dad breaking noses union and my mom <laughs> playing basketball against the dudes at UVA and just all that is just kind of helped me and, you know, pushed me really. 
and just seeing all my how all like the reality is it uh, is like all my family members have gone to like big colleges or most most of my family members have gone to big colleges and been very successful but like I really want to be the first one to just go be successful and go past that and, and really play in the NFL like that's like my dream is just to go be the next household name at Penn State as a for as a tight end you know they have one what seems like every two to three years there's always a just a big time tight end there that's like my dream and it's always kind of been my dream and it's kind of just became a reality that this could really be a possibility when I was like a sophomore in high school and ever since then it's kind of just been I wake up and my mind's on football my mind's on working out my mind's on getting better and that's the thing like and um, it also like, yeah, having a family of athletes helps, but also having a dad who like I me, mean, especially my father who like really pushes me and who really like has helped me flourish as an athlete and as a man and like make me realize that like nothing, nothing's given. And like, you have to be a physical pissed off person if you want to get things done. And like, yeah, my father's just been there for me a whole lot, and he's really helped me with everything. I'm not saying my other families haven't, but, like, if it weren't for my pops, too, like, I wouldn't really be with anything right now, so. Well, it's exciting stuff. Um, are you going to be back in Beaver Stadium for the Blue-White game? They typically are, are you know, yep. take, a, take a time to introduce the incoming freshman class. You're going to be there? Yes, sir. I'll be there April be ex- 15th, I think. April 15th, yeah. So circle yep. that one in your calendar. If you're showing up, you have a chance to, to cheer on Andrew and all of his classmates. Some of them will be in uniform participating. Many of them, like Andrew, will be, I'm assuming, wearing Penn State gear uh, and counting down the days till they can get on campus. Andrew, appreciate the, the update on where you're at. Good luck with, with finishing off your basketball career at the high school level. Um, and, and all the best to you. We'll see you in the Nittany Lions uniform pretty soon here on campus. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Great stuff by Andrew Rappelier. Let's continue our conversation now on the Lions 24-7 podcast with my colleague. He's our recruiting insider at Lions247.com. You heard him on our latest episode of this podcast, breaking down Penn State's commitment from Kari Jackson on Tuesday. And we have more to talk about, another position to focus in on on the 2024 target board. Tyler Cavaruzzo, how are we doing today? Doing well, man. Um, we just had Andrew on. Uh, he's a really impressive young man. He can really hold a conversation, as our listeners have come to realize, but he can really hold himself accountable at that tight end spot. He talked about bulking up over the 240-pound mark at this point, wanting to do everything he can within his power between now and May to show up on campus prepared to compete in what is a very crowded tight end room. All that said, what are your thoughts on Rappelier as one of those dozen incoming freshmen that that have yet to join this roster? I think it's pretty important that he's bulked up. I mean, being over 240 now and he's not even on campus yet, I would say that's a pretty big development in his development just because we've praised him so much as a receiver and a natural pass catcher, but he's still going to have to do some tight end things, right? He's still going to have to block. He's, he's going to have to get his hands dirty from time to time. So just the more mass that he can accumulate in the upper body and just the more pounds that he could put up, more good pounds that he could put on, it's only going to help him when he arrives on campus in the summer. And I've been really high on him pretty much since his commitment. I, I think he's one of the better players in this class, a guy who has a chance to outplay his ranking, which I think kind of says a lot because he is ranked pretty high. We're not talking about you know a mid-tier three-star guy. He's a top 24-7 prospect. And I think he has a chance to be even better than where he's at in the ranking. Just – You see it with the athleticism. You see it with the pass catching ability. He's steadily improved as a route runner. You know, he started out, he was really a basketball player early in his high school career, and he's developed more as a tight end. He's just gotten better and better as the years have gone on, and his rise in the rankings has reflected that development. So just, I mean, the way the work that he's been putting in the weight room is impressive. The work that I'm sure he's been putting in to just refine his skill set as a tight end that's been positive returns. So he's a prospect that Penn State fans should be really, really excited about ahead of his arrival. The tight end room is in a very different spot than it was in 2018, Tyler. But when I kind of think about it, I'm, I'm drawn back to where Pat Fryermuth was mm-hmm. uh, arriving on campus as a freshman, unlike Brenton Strange, uh, Theo Johnson, I should say uh, Khalil Dinkins. You know, these were guys that we knew had to put on some weight. I really shouldn't throw Theo Johnson in that. He, he came to campus a pretty big specimen in his own right. He kind of suffered a a setback late in his high school career that didn't let him get acclimation. There was COVID involved there. But guys like Brenton Strange, uh, Zach Koontz in the past, who was a highly rated tight end, 
you were saying we got to tuck this guy away for at least a year and see what you get on the back end of that from a physical standpoint. Throw Khalil Dinkins in a similar boat coming to campus a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those kind of tight ends. They get four-star ratings as well. But Andrew Rappelier you know, was a major riser, and I think a part of that was the collaboration of what he can do for you physically and then what he can do for you from a skill standpoint. You throw in the fact that he spent a little extra time at the prep level, coming in a, a little bit more advanced from a maturity standpoint, mentally, uh, physically, has that boarding school experience. A lot of this is, you know, the way you describe Pat Fryermuth coming to campus, a guy who was, I think, already 235, 240 pounds as a freshman. That room had just lost, lost Mike Kosicki to the NFL. Uh, there were some veterans in place. By the end of September, Pat Fryermuth was your starting tight end. Don't see that kind of a skyrocket effect happening now, but if Rappelier can come to town – and he can get on that uh, on that field in August. We've already heard him saying trying to get on the same page and, and catch up on the offensive playbook, doing what he can virtually, remotely right now. It's a tall task, but if he can get into that se uh, September uh, portion of the schedule where there are a couple games on there that you say he could get some action, he could get a little bit of runway. How does he exit September? This me, that's the big question because if the rest of that room stays healthy and that group is productive, he could be really good, and we still might might not see much of him. Exactly. You know, there are going to be plenty of opportunities for him early in the season before conference play really kicks into gear for him to get some meaningful reps and get his feet wet inside Beaters Stadium. And it's you made a great point. Where is the rest of the tight end room coming out of September and where is Rap coming out of September? You know, he could be really impactful in that month. But Penn State's tight end room could be in a place where, yeah, Rap did some really good things for you on the field, but he could still maintain that red shirt, maintain that extra year of eligibility, which would help Penn State in the wrong, in the long run and probably help his development in the long run as well. You know, he's he is physically advanced right now, I would say, but he's going to keep growing. He's going to keep growing into his frame. He's also, you know, you bring up a good point with prep school stuff, and that's not to say that, you know, anyone who doesn't get the prep school experience isn't as intellectually advanced as the ones who do. But he has that experience of, you know, being away from home. He's got the boarding school, living on campus. So some guy, you know, for some guys coming to a college campus, it's a bit of a transition. He's already had that at the high school level. So that's also something that we don't really talk about that often that could kind of help him, you know, get comfortable at Penn State and really just feel at home quicker than maybe some other guys in the class. And that could also help him get on the field sooner rather than later. So September, it will be a storyline to monitor throughout September, I would say. And again, Penn State's tight end room, is, it's a good group, right? And as good of a prospect as Rap is, you know, it, it, the playing time might just not be there for him this season. And that's perfectly fine. I don't think that's indicative of where he is in his development. It's really just going to come down to how the cards stack up and where he's at coming out of September. But yeah, I can definitely see him getting those meaningful reps and then still being in a position to maintain that red shirt. Well, freshmen are ready to help this program pick up wins. We've seen it recently. They are not going to shy away from giving young players that opportunity to prove no themselves doubt. on Saturdays. And uh, by the way, we're so fixated on the end of winter workouts, the start of spring ball. How's this team coming together? You can forget there are 13 scholarship members of this 2023 roster who are not on campus yet. You've got those 12 incoming freshmen like Andrew Rappelier, plus Dante Cephas, who a lot of people believe may end up being this team's leading receiver when it's all said and done. So a lot still to come for this roster before they get back to work in August. Uh, and of course, upcoming spring practices are going to be very important for those who are already here. Uh, Tyler, let's shift gears and go back to what we've been discussing here on the podcast the last few weeks, which is going position by position, trying to reset things as the spring arrives, visits heat up again, and eventually official visits on the horizon for this 2024 recruiting class. For those who have listened to the show of late, you've heard about quarterbacks, running backs, linebackers we're going to go to receiver now and we addressed this a few weeks ago uh, it kind of got a little bit of lay of the land because marcus higgins replacing taylor stubblefield at that position let's set the stage a little bit because higgins is just about a month now into his career as penn state's wide receiver coach spent more than a decade in that role down at uva a long time with the cavaliers where he played they got one 2023 recruit on board. Carmelo Taylor is going to be one of those freshmen coming to campus this summer, a top 24 sevens prospect, a speedster out of Virginia. He's the only scholarship freshman. They add those two transfers, Dante Cephas incoming, Malik McLean out of Florida State, already here, has been here since January making his transfer. Uh, both of those guys have two years of eligibility in their pockets. And then, of course, the coaching change, Taylor Stubblefield, three years monitoring this room, building up much of the members of this room as a recruiter, as a developer, and then ultimately dismissed a couple weeks after the Rose Bowl. 
with all that said, all that out in the open for our listeners, let's go through what you think are some of the names to know at this stage for the 2024 wide receiver. Where do you want to start? I feel like you just have to start with the fact that, you know, throughout maybe – I would say the last month, really, since Higgins got here, his board has kind of come into focus more and more by the day. You know, it, it has started to become pretty apparent who the top guys are under his watch. And Keelan Adams is one we have really circled back to pretty often. Top 100 wide out of Virginia. Had a pre-existing relationship with Higgins while Higgins was at Virginia. But at the same time, Virginia was never really in consideration for Adams all that much. So that is still a relationship that has had to be built up to some extent. But the good news for Penn State in that regard is that has come together nicely. And Penn State was already pretty high on Adams' list being in his top four, which has essentially now become a top five with Alabama offering. He's going to explore what the Crimson, what the Crimson Tide have to offer. So Nick Saban's program is going to be a player in this recruitment. But Penn State has pushed really all the right buttons with the Virginia native. Um, entering the spring, it's really a matter of timing, I would say. You know, at what point is he going to – pop before the June official visit season? Is he going to wait and take those officials before coming to a decision? Because this is a guy who's already down to five schools, essentially. And Penn State's maintained a pretty high spot on that list. So right now, I would say the Nittany Lions are sitting kind of pretty. There's definitely competition, though. I mentioned Alabama. Virginia Tech's done a pretty good job, and there is some pull to stay close to home. Tech's a good option for that. So Adam's recruitment, nothing's imminent at all. You know, it's, it's far from over. But I am interested to see, you know, if he feels so at home at a certain school, will he pop before June, before that official visit season? That's what I'm keeping an eye on with him. And, of course, the top player in Virginia, uh, based on our rankings at 24-7 Sports, you look at what Penn State accomplished in Virginia last year. I'm going off the composite rankings for this, but nonetheless, very impressive. Uh, four of – I'm sorry, six of the top ten players. I had to recount that because that is something down in Virginia, led by Alex Birchmeyer, who was the top offensive prospect in that state. And then Tony Rojas, who was the top defensive prospect in that state. And along the way, since you signed those guys – You've added one of the more respected coaches from that region and Marcus Hagans. And you're talking about a wide receiver prospect right here at the top of that Virginia list in 2024. Maybe it's some faulty math in there, but the equation seems to add up well for the Nittany Lions in terms of the confidence you could be carrying with Keelan Adams. Where else are we looking at receiver? Oh, Josiah Brown in New York's another guy. No pre-existing relationship there, but Hagans has made it a priority to get to know Brown. That's come together pretty well for Penn State. He was on campus for a junior day in January. That was another visit between him and Penn State that went pretty well. We mentioned him as a receiver, but I don't even think the door is closed on him playing in the secondary. I think mm. he's he's listening to that possibility as well, although Penn State likes him at receiver, and I think his future does lie at receiver. A lot of big dogs in that recruitment along with Penn State, Ohio State's involved. There's a lot of prominent programs, and the spring and the summer will be telling for him. As that, That's going to be pretty much a common theme with every wide receiver name we discussed today, I would say. It's going to come down to where do these guys get to in March and April, and then where do they lock in these official visits for June. When it comes to Brown, I think Penn State has put itself definitely in the conversation to receive an official. feel pretty good about that, but we're going to have to see what goes on with him throughout the spring. Uh, the, the another name that we have uh, addressed here, one of my favorites on the trail, is Nitro Tuggle, um, a player out of Indiana. Uh, Penn State looks like they're going to be uh, welcoming him to campus relatively soon. What, what's what's the status here? Because this is a guy whose profile is blown up. I think I mentioned this on the podcast, shaping up to be perhaps the highest, uh, you know, highest most coveted wide receiver out of that state since perhaps David Bell, who ended up staying in his home state with the Purdue Boilermakers. You know, that seemed like a pretty accurate projection at this point, I would say. We talked about Penn State doing a good job of getting involved with Tuggle earlier than a lot of the other bigger programs that haven't gotten involved since the beginning of the winter. But, I mean, we, we've been talking about him as a steady riser as well, and you're seeing it. I mean, yesterday he put out that he's going to be taking an official visit to Georgia in June and you know defending national champions he's gonna be he's one of their top targets at this point at receiver and that's always just something that's going to be tough to beat with what the way George is rolling along on the trail right now and you know Penn State fans know that given what transpired last cycle between the Nittany Lions and Georgia there were a lot of battles between those two programs but Penn State getting in when it did with Tuggle it's a big help he's going to be on campus at the end of March and I think the Nittany Lions are going to have a chance to lock down an official with him at some point it really comes down to scheme fit that he sees that in Happy Valley, which is a plus for Mike Gersh as he goes on throughout this recruitment. 
And as Hagen's works to build a relationship with him, you know, it, it's not a situation where Penn State, you know, it, it wasn't a situation where Taylor Stubblefield was steering the ship and then Hagen's had to come in and take over. This was a later offer. So it's kind of a fresh slate for everyone involved between those two parties. So Penn State getting him back on in, on campus in March, that's important. And if you can move to lock down that official, I'd say that's a really, really key target. Tuckle's a guy with some serious size, six foot three frame on, on 24 seven sports. Keelan Adams, by the way, not lacking, uh, but, but, but no. just, just a different, different level in terms of what the size you're bringing to that position. Uh, when we uh, continue to work our way through this, Jere Hawkins is a name that we have referenced a few times here in the podcast, but it feels like maybe it's been a while since you addressed him. It has. And he's maintained with me pretty much since he made it to campus in September for the home opener. He traveled from his home in West Virginia to state college and he really loved the experience he's maintained that penn state's pretty much the top school on this list and i'll be interested to see what going to img academy for his senior season does and the kind of impact that that has because a player like hawkins where you know he's from west virginia not necessarily the biggest program in the state and he's going to img he's going to be playing against this top level competition and there are going to be a lot more eyes on him in that four, two, four, three, 40 yard dash speed that he has. That's mm. how well he's tested. He's put up, I believe it was around not a Penn state, not the whiteout camp, but before that, if they believe he ran like a four, two, eight, then he comes to state college for the whiteout camp. He's posting four, three flats. I mean, he caught the eye of the Penn state staff that day culminated in an offer. And he's been and Tyler. Tyler he, he has gone sub 10, five in the 100 meters. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> This guy's times are ridiculous, man. I feel like we could spend the whole episode just looking at Miles Split and looking at his track times. It's absurd. And now he's going to go to IMG and show everyone that he's not just a track guy. That he's a pretty good receiver prospect as well. So where does Penn State stand after that? Because I do expect some bigger programs to get involved with offers. And when I say bigger, I mean Big Ten rivals. I mean the SEC programs of the world who are down there seeing him more and more than other programs in the Northeast. So right now, yes, Penn State does sit in a good spot with Hawkins. I'd like to see him get back to campus during the spring and possibly even the summer to kind of dictate where that interest still lies and where he is on the mm -hmm. board as well. Because that's a new thing. You know, Hagan's that's another guy that he's had to play catch up with because I was a stubble field guy. So Hawkins, one to know, but kind of in flux right now, I would say, just given the transfer situation, where he's at on the board and when he gets back to campus. Yeah, guy lands at IMG halfway through his junior year. It's it's not something that's uncommon at this point. Uh, it says a lot about who Definitely you are as a prospect, but yeah. it, it's still a thing where you kind of step back. We did it with Drew Shelton a couple of years ago, and some folks in the Penn State fan base thought it could end up being a bad thing, and he did take some visits to, the, to Gainesville down there and ends up coming home to finish his high school career and signing with Penn State, but you know, it is kind of a new wrinkle when, when, you, when you end up down there in Bradenton, Florida, and just to kind of reflect – what you could see come of this for Hawkins in the last 24 hours offers from the Florida Gators and the Miami Hurricanes now. So a couple new programs to consider in that recruitment process. Hawkins, far more diminutive than some of the other running, uh, receivers we've discussed. 5'9", 160 pounds, just outside the top 100 overall rankings for 24-7 sports. And then another name to get into out of state here before we circle back with a couple here in the state of Pennsylvania, Chance Wiggins. And – Wiggins is interesting because while Adams doesn't have that pre-existing relationship that is as strong with Higgins, Wiggins does because UVA has been all over him pretty much since, excuse me, the early stages of his recruitment. And Higgins was in charge of all of that. And now that's at Penn State. And I've talked to him about this and he told me that Higgins being there is a pretty big deal for him because he already had that comfort level with Penn State. But now he's got a position coach who he's known for years and he was on another guy who, this is the theme, on campus in January for a junior day, had a really good experience, furthered that relationship with the staff. And, you know, Higgins is pretty much his guy. He's been his guy really throughout his recruitment. So I would say Penn State right now in a pretty good spot there in that recruitment. And, and we're back on uh, with the, the big bodied receiver type here in Chance Wiggins, yes. six foot three, pushing towards 190 pounds. He is also a four star prospect in 24 seven sports out of King George High School down in Virginia. And then let's circle back state of Pennsylvania. I think the top guy in this state is already committed. Uh, Tysier Denmark has been to committed to Oregon for some time now, of course, along the way. 
Penn State put together a really impressive season. Uh, they've got some things cooking on the offensive side of things. They've got a new receivers coach. Um, time continues to, to march on. Is, is Ty Sear Denmark a guy that you're going to at least be monitoring on the back burner, if not more so, as this thing goes on? Because he was phenomenal at Penn State's camp last summer. The back burner is probably the best place to put him right now because from what I've heard, it's going to take a lot to get him off Oregon. He feels really comfortable out in Eugene. But with that being said, Roman Catholic guy, Penn State has had success there before. I wouldn't expect them to stop trying. I don't think they have stopped trying. I don't think Ohio State has stopped trying with Denmark either. He's a really good prospect off the board right now. But other schools, including Penn State, are still going to stay on him. I don't really know if I see anything coming to fruition there with him moving off Oregon at any point. I think he's really, really solid there right now. So if I'm a Penn State fan, I'm not exactly getting my hopes up. But, hey, look, we, we've seen this staff make moves before, right? And if you have a big season like a lot of people are anticipating Penn State could potentially have, who knows how the perception changes for a guy like Denmark? You know, obviously more goes into a commitment than wins and losses. There, there's a lot of other things that go on behind the scenes with recruiting pitches as well. But how does a big season by Penn State maybe change things? Because Denmark did visit Penn State for the whiteout game before he committed to Oregon. So Penn State really got the last crack at him before he committed to Oregon. And I, I think that says something. And I think that spoke to where his interest in the program was at that time. I think he was giving it some serious consideration. But again, right now, as things stand, I'm not really expecting him to move off Oregon. Yeah, and he will have a friend and teammate on campus here as a freshman, Jameel Lyons, uh, a part of those uh, summer enrollees heading to campus, defensive lineman at Roman Catholic. Just another kind of uh, note there with Tysier Denmark out of Philadelphia. Uh, let's look elsewhere. A couple mm -hmm. uncommitted wide receivers in the state of Pennsylvania that we've discussed in the past here on the podcast. One is Rico Scott, and the other is Peter Gonzalez. Um, where are they on the Nittany Lions board, and, and, and what do you make of, of, of what this spring means for each of them in respect to how things shape up here at Penn State? With Scott, it's tough to say because his recruitment has just been so quiet. He was last in town in October. He, he attended the Ohio State game, and he had a good time. But, I mean, Scott's recruitment has just been really, really quiet throughout the duration. I think Penn State likes the Bishop McDevitt product, but – there are other guys that they're involved with, and I think the same goes for Peter Gonzalez up at Central Catholic. They do like him, and they have been recruiting him, but there are guys, you know, all higher on the board, really. And that that's just really the way Higgins' board is kind of taking shape. But with circling back to Scott, Kentucky likes him. I know that. There are some Big Ten players as well, so – He's still got that high-level Power 5 interest for sure. He, his, he has a lofty place in the rankings, so, so we're going to see where he gets in the spring. And with Gonzalez, I mean, the Pitt legacy, but he's been to Penn State countless times at this point, as much as any, as much as any 2024 target on the board, I would say. He made it back in January, end of January. He attended the final junior day, has Penn State in his top three. I think the relationship there between the staff and Gonzalez is good. Again, with him, it's really about what receivers ahead of him on the board decide to do and where Penn State stands with those guys. Gonzalez is a solid prospect, and he's definitely on the radar, though. Well, you've got Gonzalez at number 14 in, in Pennsylvania rankings for 2024 cycle, according to 24-7 Sports. Quinton Martin leads that list, but at the wide receiver position, you got Tyser Denmark at number three, and uh, the mysterious – Rico Scott at number two in those rankings, the number four and number five guys on that list, Cooper Cousins, Anthony Specka, already on board with Penn State's 2024 recruiting class. And we'll see if they get some company by way of an in-state pickup at the end of this week. We got a Friday announcement coming through 24-7 Sports. So you can catch it uh, on our YouTube page with 24-7 Sports. Uh, Kenneth Wosley out of Philadelphia, Imhotep Institute. He's a guy that we've addressed on the last couple of episodes because he put out a top list and he had a timeline in mind. And your crystal ball has been in for a bit. Final thoughts on this one as he gets ready to uh, announce where he plans to sign with in December. I'm honestly not sure if I have a whole lot different to say, really, beyond what we've been saying. Penn State has done some really good work with Wosley. I would say that they sit at the top of his list heading into this 5 p.m. Eastern announcement on Friday. So I like where the Nittany Lions are at to finish this recruitment off strong for the time being. And I say for the time being because this is going to be a process that continues to play out beyond a commitment, whether it be to Penn State or another school among his favorites. Nebraska is going to get a visit, it looks like, coming after – Wilsey's decision. So the Huskers are definitely going to be in play. Michigan's going to stay in play. Rutgers will probably stay in play to some extent as well. I'm not really sure 
to what extent right now. I think Michigan and Nebraska are definitely above Rutgers, but at the same time, that's another school that he has visited a couple of times and has a good relationship with the staff there. And it's a big 10 program and it's close to home. So they're going to be on the radar as well. But right now, Penn state, I mean, they've just pushed a lot of the right buttons with Wellesley. They have sold the on and off the fields fit so well. There's a reason that he feels comfortable enough to announce in early March when we originally thought this might be a recruitment that drags on a little bit more throughout the spring. So I like where our crystal balls are at. And I think that's just really the best place to leave it right now. Penn state coming off a a strong recruiting class at cornerback in the 2023 cycle. We'll see if they get going in the 2024 cycle could be a Friday uh, happy hour for Penn state fans, potentially Uh, follow that coverage on a 24 seven sports, the YouTube page. And then of course at lines, 24, com for feedback and reaction to whichever way Kenneth Wosley goes on Friday. He is the number 33 cornerback in 24 seven sports composite rankings nationally. That puts him at number eight in the state of Pennsylvania overall and puts him at four star stat. Status. Tyler, I think that's going to do it for our conversation on this episode. We'll be back uh, in a little while. I'm going on vacation for a bit, so the list is probably going to pile up. I'm, I hope you keep track of what we need to catch up on when I get back here from a recruiting standpoint. Oh, we'll be good to go when you get back, man. Don't even don't even worry about it. All right. Well, we're going to take a little bit of a break here on the podcast, as I said, during the next week, heading down to sunnier climates with my wife and kid for a little while. Be back. Batteries recharge uh, and fresh to get after it for spring ball. We'll have pro day coming here to Penn State. NFL scouts are going to be here on campus in just a few weeks. So we've got a ton going on. And by the way, all in the backdrop of it, recruiting visits. They're going to be back on Tyler Calvaruzzo and company keeping track of it. Tyler, appreciate the good work as always. Talk to you real soon. Looking forward to it, man. All right. Big thanks to Tyler Calvaruzzo, who you can catch any time of the day over at lines247.com with his coverage. And once again, thanks to Andrew Rappelier. We'll be seeing him here in Happy Valley in just a matter of months. For now, stepping aside for a week or so, I'm Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast. We'll catch up with you in mid-March when we've got on-field football to discuss.